I'm gonna be honest with you guys, until recently, I was one of those people who felt like artificers didn't really fit the genre of my D&D games. I'm usually going for high fantasy, and artificers felt very steampunk to me. I just didn't really want to play Lord of the Rings, but there are guns, you know what I mean? But then I read this book. This is Artificers and Alchemy, the latest book in the Young Adventurer's Guide series. These are officially licensed D&D products, but they aren't game books. They're more like cultural primers on the core concepts of D&D, like spells and classes and monsters. When they asked to sponsor this YouTube video, at first I was unsure. This series is aimed at kids ages 8 to 12, and while apparently they are very popular with parents and teachers and librarians, I don't run games for kids, personally, so I wasn't sure that I would have much to say about them. But they also mentioned that these are an easy-to-digest introduction for new D&D players of any age. So I started flipping through the book, and that was when I realized that I had been thinking about artificers all wrong. But first, let's talk about why me and so many others have concerns about the artificers vibes. Because from the way people talk about them online, I am not the only one. I'm not a fan of too much tech in Artificers break fantasy. the very It just doesn't fit in with they the kill the They just don't really the 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 Much of the flavor around the class, both in the mechanics and in the artwork, has a distinctly steampunk feel. A sort of Victorian industrial. Lots of brass and clockwork, and everybody's wearing goggles. The class is often described as being science meets magic, which is not quite in line with the high fantasy, swords and sorcery genre found in a typical D D table. Now this isn't terribly surprising, considering that the Artificer was originally introduced in Eberron, which is definitely one of the more industrial-feeling D&D settings, featuring things like airships, trains, and of course the Warforged, which are not robots, but they're kind of robots. To me, this seems very parallel to the question of whether or not your D&D game includes guns. It's less about the actual history of technology, because yes, I know that guns were invented during the Middle Ages, and more about our perceptions. Other than the occasional flintlock pistol in the hand of a fantasy pirate, we aren't used to seeing firearms and artillery in a high fantasy setting. Legolas doesn't carry a rifle, Arya Stark doesn't train with a handgun. In short, technology like this can feel immersion-breaking. And to be clear, this isn't true for everyone. There are plenty of people who either have no problem incorporating artificers into their swords and sorcery games, or who actively welcome those steampunk vibes. But for people like me, who want a more classically high fantasy tone, the artificer kind it doesn't feel like it fits in. At first, Artificers and Alchemy just confirmed this for me. There's a big metal construct and a brass owl on the cover, there's a whole section on clockwork creatures, and a lot of the illustrations of Artificers feature that classic steampunk goggles aesthetic. But as I actually read about the class, I started to realize that I'd fallen victim to one of the classic blunders. The most famous, of course, is never get involved in a land war in Corvair, but only slightly less well-known is this. Never make your mechanical decisions based on flavor. There is a reason that half of this book is dedicated to magic items. When reduced to its core purpose, the Artificer is just a spellcaster who channels their magic through objects. Not only is that not inherently industrial, it's a really unique class concept. We have charisma and wisdom-based casters coming out of our ears in 5th edition, but out of the core classes, only wizards use intelligence. Having another option with a completely different functionality than the wizard is pretty exciting. The more I thought about the role an artificer fills, the more I recognized that the steampunk flavor is just set dressing. Once I got that into my head, so many parts of this book started to stick out to me. For example, there's a section about household constructs that includes the rug of smothering and a guardian portrait. Some part of me must have known that the rug of smothering had the creature type construct, but that part of me was not participating in my mental conversation about artificers. When I thought of constructs, I thought of warforged and clockwork creatures and modrons, but I looked up all the creatures with the type construct and realized I was focusing on a really narrow slice of that category. You know what other creatures are constructs? Flying swords, living dolls, scarecrows, animated statues. Just like there are plenty of constructs that don't feel steampunk, there are also plenty of ways to create an artificer who doesn't feel like a wacky inventor from the 1800s. Let me show you how. Last year, I tried to create a character sheet for my wood witch Morelia, who's appeared in a few of my videos. She's a classic fairy tale witch, living in a cute little cottage in the forest and specializing in potion making. She's a little absent-minded, and sometimes her potions can be unpredictable. But when I was trying to choose a class for her, none of them quite felt like they fit. It turns out that the alchemist artificer would have been perfect for her, even down to the experimental elixirs, which are randomly rolled. But I couldn't see it, because I was too blinded by the aesthetic. I would argue that the alchemist subclass is the easiest one to fit into a high fantasy genre. Even though alchemy is described as happening 
in a lab, giving it a distinctly mad scientist feel. Let's be honest, it's just potions. And what's more high fantasy than potions? This subclass is focused mainly on healing, so why not create an alchemist who's functionally the party's medic? Healing with spells, like a cleric might, but also keeping healing potions in stock for the whole crew. I'm imagining a healer collecting plants and minerals and alchemical ingredients on their travels, with bundles of drying herbs and some monster's spleen suspended in a vial of liquid on their belt. When the party settles in to rest for the night, they've got their mortar and pestle out, mixing up elixirs for the next day's travels. I don't know about you, but I could totally picture a character like that in Game of Thrones. In Artificers and Alchemy, it's suggested that alchemists who don't work in a lab might work in a classroom or a library or even a kitchen. Imagine an alchemist who cooks up magical soups and stews to ladle out to her party members, mixing arcane ingredients into each one for both function and flavor. Or maybe they're the fantasy equivalent of an Appalachian moonshiner, mixing up nose hair singeing concoctions that taste like paint thinner and burn all the way down. Can an alchemist be Dr. Jekyll or Victor Frankenstein doing their experiments in a gothic era laboratory full of bubbling test tubes? Sure, but they can just as easily be the evil queen from Snow White stirring a gigantic Cauldron, or Miracle Max from The Princess Bride making chocolate-covered resurrection pills. Ah, the Armorer, aka Iron Man, or the Knights from Fallout's Brotherhood of Steel, or probably a bunch of different stuff in anime, I don't know, that's not my thing. Obviously, armor is already very present in D&D, both mundane and magical. I mean, nobody bats an eye at a plus one breastplate, and we're very used to things like mithril armor in The Lord of the Rings. But it's hard to imagine enchanted armor that can be taken on or off in an instant, that makes you stronger and faster, and that has built-in weapons without imagining something that very much feels like science fiction. Oh, unless you're Brandon Sanderson. I'm referring, of course, to Shardplate, a magical armor from Sanderson's story Stormlight Archives. Shardplate is a rare, ancient type of armor that shapes to the wearer's body, making them incredibly strong and fast. Instead of running on electricity like the armor in science fiction, Shardplate is powered by magically infused gems. So basically, fantasy-flavored Iron Man. Now I'm not saying you need to use Shardplate in your game, but I think it's a great example of how any concept can be spun to a different genre. Sanderson's universe is not technology heavy. They fight with swords and spears, they travel on horseback or on foot or by wagon, and they communicate long distance and even light their lamps with magic. Yet, Shardplate fits very neatly into this world and doesn't break the immersive nature of its fantasy. Full plate can be encrusted with glowing runes or studded with magical gems. Thunder gauntlets and lightning launchers can invoke an actual storm rather than a more modern electricity, maybe generating a mist of dark clouds or the scent of rain when acting. When I imagine enchanted armor that appeals to my genre sensibilities, none of it feels like sci-fi. What if the so-called second skin of an artificer's arcane armor is a layer of rigid bark, enveloping your limbs in a creaking layer of wood and the scent of pine sap? When in guardian mode, your gauntlets strike with the thunderous crash of a great tree falling, and in infiltrator mode, the bark blackens and smokes as if lightning struck before directing an electric bolt at your enemies. Or maybe it's crystal armor that shields you, glittering and reflective, distorting the figure within, always humming with a slight glow of arcane energy. I'm just saying there's a lot of possibilities. Okay, this is the Artificer subclass that seems to hit on all the reasons people dislike the flavor of this class. The Artillerist is very focused on projectile firearms, and while we can point to medieval technology and say, look, they were totally making artillery, the fact remains that this is a vibe that a lot of people just don't seem to want in their D&D games. Of course, Eldritch Cannons are just doing magic. They're casting the same spells that other classes are casting. The only real difference is that they are coming out of a cannon, instead of your outstretched hand. But I want to share the one specific detail about Eldritch Cannons that instantly made me like them. They can have legs. Not legs like a table, legs like a creature. And if they have legs, they can walk around. Now, this could feel sci-fi too, of course. I'm a millennial, I had a techno puppy, I get it. But it doesn't have to. After all, this is magic, and those legs don't need to be jointed metal legs like we would expect out of a robot. Who's to say your Eldritch Cannon doesn't have legs made of wood, or bone, or just glowing arcane light? Maybe it's a little animated stone dog, or a sculpted wooden flower with the legs of a spider. I also think the word cannon makes that specific feature feel more restrictive than it needs to be. None of the mechanics of this item rely on it having a certain shape, or needing gunpowder or anything. In fact, they can be small enough to fit in your hand. All it really needs is an opening to fire its spells from, and honestly, even that feels negotiable. After all, a wand can fire spells and so can a staff. 
I see absolutely no reason that you couldn't create an eldritch cannon in the form of a wand with legs. Now that's some whimsical Hayao Miyazaki shit. And of course, your arcane firearm is specifically defined as being a wand, rod, or staff despite a kind of misleading name. The artillerist section in Artificers and Alchemy suggests that this is the subclass for people who, quote, like making things explode. But let's be honest, isn't that the evocation wizard too? If you can rethink your expectations for projectile weapons, I think you'll find this subclass a lot more flexible. Okay, I really just have one thing to say about the battlesmith. Does it have to be a steel defender? You don't have to answer, I'll answer for you. No, it doesn't. The Battlesmith Artificer has a companion of their own design, which is armed and armored. Similar to a ranger's animal companion, the steel defender is an essential part of the class. You know what isn't essential though? The steel part. The minute you remove the metallic flavoring of this creature, your options instantly blow wide open. What would you build a companion out of if you weren't constrained by the limitations of reality? Would you stitch it together from the pieces of other creatures? Would you shape one out of molten glass or grow it from a seed, guiding it into shape? Would you build it from the discarded pieces of broken swords and shields or carve it from wood? The steel defender has the same stat block no matter how you describe it, and nothing about that stat block relies on it being made of steel. I would argue that out of all of the Artificer subclasses, this one leaves the most room for creativity in its flavor. Heck, you could play Geppetto and have Pinocchio be your steel defender. Wait, I'm obsessed with that. Can someone please do that? Now, there will be people who claim that you shouldn't have to completely reskin a class in order for it to fit your game, and I completely get that stance. But also, a lot of the things we just discussed don't even contradict what's written in the class description of the Artificer. All I'm saying is that if you're interested in what the class can offer, but put off by the aesthetic, that aesthetic is optional. Yeah, this book was written for children, but reading about this class separate from its game mechanics really helped me step back and think about Artificers not as a game mechanic, but as part of the fantasy world of D&D. And from that angle, they felt a lot more exciting to me. By the way, this book also includes information on magical phenomena, sentient weapons, and other cool magic items that players might encounter or create in their games. I'm eager to flip through the rest of these books and see how they encourage me to think differently about other classes and concepts concepts in D&D. Who knows, maybe I'll learn to love fighters. Unlikely, but not impossible. If you want to check out the rest of the Young Adventurer's Guide series, whether that's to invite the children in your life to explore the world of D&D, to help educate new players, or even just because they look cute as heck on your bookshelf, I will put the link into the description. In the meantime, if you're feeling inspired to move past the cliches and stereotypes and get more creative with your D&D characters, you should check out this video about bards next. Who knows, maybe I'll learn to love fighters. That was a terrible way to hold that book. It was weird and awkward. Why did I do that?